Right, morning ladies and gentlemen, thanks for the attendance. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors from Cape Town. Uh, this was commissioned by the Grass and Society for a special edition of the journal. It is out in print already. Apologies for those who attended Bloemfontein. It is a repeat pretty much of what you heard there. But I think the audience by and large is a separate audience. I think this dynamic has immense implications for conservation of both savannas and grasslands. Um, but the specific topic we address here is trying to understand what is causing bush encroachment and by first examining the extent of changes in southern Africa. Now here's a set of repeat photographs striking in their own right. Over a relatively brief period of time we see immense changes. We have to ask Firstly, the simple act of science documenting how much, but the real question is why? Why are these changes happening? And in this discourse, which cuts across a number of continents, there is talk about are some drivers local, for example, grazing fire versus those which are global, CO2 being the popular one espoused by many. Uh, we like to, we wish to elaborate this question to discuss whether these drivers have actually been consistent over time or have changed over time. And is it really the same drivers acting across space or do we have to be very location specific in our assessment of this? So first of all, I'm going to give you a brief historical review of bush encroachment and a, a brief review of the history of some of the main purported drivers of encroachment listed there. Now in this, in a, in a review, one has time to dissect the conceptual basis, which in this case is the tree-grass relationship in savannas, which has received immense, an immense amount of attention over the past few decades. There is not time in a talk to, to address that. So when assessing a purported driver, just think, we, we're dealing with changes over time out in the real world. It's not an experimental situation, really. How can you extract evidence which might support or negate the role of a specific driver? Well, we look for correspondence between the temporal pattern of encroachment, as best as it's been recorded, and the temporal pattern of a driver. There are some long-term experiments um, conducted by primarily by agriculture departments and in some cases conservation which have direct bearing on certain drivers. And if we understand at a process level um, the, the effects of a driver, we have a body of evidence by which to possibly draw conclusions. So is encroachment new? We scoured the literature. I'm sure we've missed one or two studies, but I think the, the general story remains the same. Encroachment is not new. We have the earliest record we picked up from the Southern Kalahari in the 1860s, then a number from KZN, um, uh, an early one from around Peter Maritzburg actually by Buse in, in the early 1900s, in which the introduction of wattle was uh, offered as the cause of encroachment of acacia melodica because it was no longer being heavily harvested. Uh, some of the others are more conventional up in Zululand, uh, issues of fire suppression, that's common, Springbok flats that pops up in the 30s. And so it goes on. The simple point, if you scan this table or look at it at your own leisure in, in the paper, is that prior to the 1950s, encroachment was well recorded across the breadth of southern Africa. Right, so now let's look at encroachment post-1950. And here we have the benefit of um, a number of a quantitative approach being introduced. The, the previous studies were primarily descriptive. And these are based on remote sensing of various forms. Again, we scoured the literature, and yes, again, I'm sure we've missed a couple given the time constraints, but I don't think we missed a lot. I think we, we've got a pretty comprehensive list. Now, firstly, it's a paltry list. 23 studies on a dynamic which is meant to be of such immense importance, I thought, was actually disappointing. Nonetheless, that's what we've got to go on. And that's their spread, if you look at the points there, quite a few down the eastern littoral, a, a couple throughout... Um, the, the bushveld areas, the interior bushveld areas, one or two in Namibia, Botswana, etc. But uh, a definite spatial bias uh, that has to be taken into consideration. Now, from 
From these, most of them being aerial photography studies, studies using aerial photography that quantify for given years of photography the amount of bush cover and therefore we could annualize or calculate a percent annual increase in woody cover and, and the, the range of figures is quite interesting. In, in our last remaining large wildlife system, that is the, the Kruger National Park, we actually see that there was uh, no encroachment, in other words, a, a consistent loss, very slight loss of woody cover on the basalts of central Kruger Park. The second lowest was a very slight increase in the granites of central Kruger National Park. The maximum was recorded for a Dambo, 1.275% per annum increase in woody cover. A Dambo is a flay, by the way. Um, and a, a couple of other figures of relatively high there. Now, you might think that 1% is not a lot. This is a per annum measure over 20, 20 years. That's a considerable increase. Uh, remember that in most savannas, you're not attaining 100%. Um, so, a, a very pronounced range. So, things, things are not happening uniformly out there, it would seem. Now, we used these figures as best we could to gain some depiction of when did the maximum rate of bush encroachment actually occur. If you've got a, a sequence of photographs, you can calculate the annual rate per interval. So, you know, if the person had 1940, then 1950, 60, 70, etc., if you're that lucky. Most of them use about three or four sets at best. You can, you can calculate the, the annual rate and see which, which interval offered the, the most rapid increase of bush encroachment. And I think this is a, an important little depiction because you'll see there's a, a distinct peak in the early 1970s there. Um, and there are probably not too many people in the audience old enough to remember, but the 1970s were a particularly wet decade that followed a particularly serious drought decade of the 1960s over most of southern Africa. So already I'm, I'm inferring a, a climatic correlation to that pattern. Um, but the point is, bush encroachment has not proceeded at a uniform rate. And for the historical record, and you will notice that this graph comes to an end before 2000. We do not have sufficient data for the last 15, 20 years or whatever to, to extend that graph. And I think that's a, a big missing component. But uh, just in terms of trying to dissect some of the other influences, we looked at land use. And there's a set of figures that most of the time, but with an exception, and it's a small sample size, you're finding that commercial livestock ranching experiences a greater rate of increasement, of increase than um, communal tenure areas. Um, so yes, a definite suggestion that land use, and land use does not give a precise statement of exactly what it is about land use. It's simply, we can expect that land use has left an imprint. And obviously we recognize that there are differences in grazing regimes, in fire regimes, in rates of resource extraction, etc. cetera. Um, so it really behoves us to then look in a, little, in a little bit more detail at the history of some of these individual purported drivers of bush encroachment. And for the purpose of the talk, I've singled out four, which I believe are those most commonly given prominence. Fire suppression, chronic grazing, browsing pressure, and the global chain story. And uh, with reference to Susan's Flavor of the Month thing, uh, you know, there's, there's widespread comment and almost a willingness to attribute bush encroachment to increases in CO2. And I think when, the, when there's a bandwagon, you, you've got to have a close look at just how well supported it is. Um, so let's just start a look with looking at fire suppression. And with all of these, you want to sort of say, can this driver on its own account for bush encroachment, or does it require an interaction with some other key driver? And to look at that, you want to have a look at fire suppression. You know, is there a history there that would be consistent with it having been a, a key agent for, for bush encroachment? And if you do suppress fire, does it really have that much of an effect? So let's start with the history of fire suppression. Now again, um, 
you can try and scan that quickly, but I'll, I'll let you in. What you pick up there is a number of historical statements which quite clearly demonstrate that the intent was to exclude, suppress fire, exclude and suppress fire across most southern African countries. This legislation, a lot of it is old. Now, obviously, legislation does not mean practice, but the fact is the intent was there. And certainly, at the start of the 20th century, there's um, sufficient evidence that fire suppression was very real on, on commercial livestock ranches. So putting this as a composite, I think one can make a statement that fire suppression, in terms of Southern Africa, acted as a relatively global driver, not simply a local driver. That is not to say there wouldn't have been considerable spatial variation. That is not to say there would not have been some exceptions. But fire suppression was a concerted, legislated act over a large part of the country for a considerable period of time. And that simple fact must not be ignored in terms of interpreting bush encroachment. Now let's look. What happens when you exclude fire? Now he has a set of sites again with their mean annual rainfall in the left column. And in all cases, for the sample of six in which one can compare the change in woody cover, the rate of annual change in woody cover under fire protection with burning, you will see that there was Let's go from the bottom there, 8.7 to 8.6, minor, 8.5, 2.404, very major, 7.5, 2.06, very major, 5.9 to minus 0.99, very major, 11.1 to 0 0.8, very major. Now notice, yeah, because it pops up in the next graph, that at low mean annual rainfall, you're actually getting a decline in woody cover under fire protection. Um, so what we see in here, but that uh, you have a relationship with mean annual rainfall possibly, but that on average fire protection is resulting in an increase in woody cover but seems to be influenced by mean annual rainfall. So what we then did was take all the data we could See, the, the previous slide was where you had direct comparisons. We also had a number of studies where you'd have a measure of woody increase under fire protection. Um, this was based on the early workers tended to count plants. And you can criticize a measure, but it's what we've got. And I think the resulting graph is a reasonable vindication of using the data. So when you plot the annual change in plant density against mean annual rainfall. You get a superb linear relationship, but there's a couple of points to pick up about this relationship. Um, right, so the, the high rainfall area. Um, you suppress fire, you get a phenomenal rate of increase. But what, and, and yes, there are, there are a couple of outlier points. I'm not yet to go through each and every point. What I want to pick up is two key features. This low rainfall area here is that suppress fire and you can actually decrease the amount of woody material. Then there's a highly variable area, let's say from 300 through to about 600. There is a soil influence here, there's sand felt paired with thorn felt in a couple of places, behave very differently. There are ecological factors taking place here. But across this thing, there is a linear relationship, and the interesting thing is a reversal of behavior at low rainfall, and it's a real reversal when you actually read the papers closely. Um, that is interpreted in terms of an improvement in grass competition on woody growth. Um, so, Fire suppression certainly has a lot of good evidence going for it as a major agent having influenced bush encroachment in the country. Chronic grazing, what does it do? It's got two effects. It can reduce the fuel load, um, so it influences fire, but it can also reduce grass competition, especially during a drought. So that's a more direct effect on the growth of, of other plants there. 
And we expect then that heavy grazing during a grain period would have a more serious effect than simply defoliation during the dry season in which you, you are removing the, the fuel load, but you're not necessarily having an effect on competition once regrowth starts. And let's then look. Is there a history that the grazing pressure in Southern Africa has changed? Yeah, we plot cattle, sheep, and goats. The top left, let's ignore. And let's go straight to top right, the cattle. You can see that for both communal and commercial, reaching a phenomenal peak. Bear, the, bear in mind the slide mentioned about the patterns of woody increase. A phenomenal peak in the 1960s drought. So there's a direct correspondence between when livestock numbers peaked on commercial areas. Um, uh, is that commercial or communal? I can't see from here, but anyway. Um, but peaked in, in both these areas and has subsequently declined considerably. I won't go too much into to sheep in that. Uh, sheep peaked very early and have been low. Um, the goat story, goats have consistently increased on communal areas and consistently decreased on, on um, commercial livestock areas. The critical graph is this, this one, in which I, I feel there's an unequivocal demonstration of a correspondence in chronic grazing pressure um, at the height of the droughts going into the, the, the wet 70s. Uh, that just as a matter of interest indicates the Rinderpest collapse in, in our opinion um, in the 1896 Rinderpest got to the Cape but we won't go there. So right we're hitting evidence yeah that suggests that chronic grazing uh, might, might have been a factor. Now, the review would pull out, obviously, all the examples. I've just put out one here for demonstration. And what you are seeing here is, over time, if you look at um, the amount of grazing during the growing season, those plots receiving the most intense grazing over the growing season is, is the top line. So there's one example from the Toowoomba Research Station that Heavy grazing during the grain season promotes bush encroachment. And there are similar studies from, uh, which offer additional support. So let's get on then to a third potential driver of bush encroachment, browsing pressure. And at the outset, I think it must be emphasized that this is something that sets Africa apart from the rest of the world is that we still have a complement not only of, of megafauna, yes, the elephants attract attention, but the, the, the one, the diversity, and two, the former abundance of our browsing herbivores is underappreciated in terms of the ecological role they, they played. And there's a few simple things to be drawn from this. Between 1840 and about 1900, over southern Africa, you in effect saw the near elimination of mega herbivores. Uh, the ivory hunting is obviously well documented. You all filled in with that. What I find intriguing about reading things like Delagorg and Baldwin and Salou and that, not Salou so much, he was towards the end, but the ones operating in, in the mid-18th century, uh, eight, well, 18, 1800s, that's another century, um, is just how conspicuous both white and black rhino were. They were dominant herbivores in terms of biomass of a lot of systems. So there's another large herbivore that uh, people tend to think of as a, as a relatively uncommon herbivore. It wasn't. It was, it was one of the major contributors to biomass. Um, Elant were incredibly widespread and incredibly abundant. So the potential browsing impact was large. We don't, uh, and, and yes, it was affected by rinderpest as well. So not only hunting, but disease put paid to most of the browsing pressure um, during the 19th century. And I would argue this constitutes a global decline in Southern African context. And actually, I should have mentioned, looking at the increasing grazing, certainly for commercial areas and communal areas, it was global in the Southern African context. There might have been a few properties which didn't follow that trend, but by and large, one gains reasonably convincing evidence that most people followed that pattern. Um, 
Now, unfortunately, browsing is, is one that's not nearly as well investigated as, as fire or, or chronic grazing. I think we're well aware of what elephants can do, and actually I'm presenting a talk later on elephant impacts. Interestingly, some of the experimental stuff shows just how important rodents in combination with elephants can be because they're affecting different life history processes. And there's certainly reasonable evidence that things like rhinos and giraffes have a, a meaningful effect on the abundance of woody uh, plants, as do impala, bushwhack, and inyala. All of these browser species, even diminutive dick dick, these local sedentary species like dick dick, and we imagine stembok as well and dacre, have an effect on the abundance of woody material. But overall, this role in bush encroachment is, is one of the poorly researched gaps, despite the fact that it sets Africa apart from other continents. And just a, a quick example from my own experience of, of what elephants can do. Uh, we started in 97 monitoring elephant impacts in, in this reserve, semi-arid Mopani felt. I didn't take a picture of this woodland in 97 because you were inside a dense woodland. By 2002 it opened up and 2010 it had reverted to the hydromorphic grassland it used to be. So elephants, where they do select, and they are very selective animals, can result in a rapid transformation of vegetation. In this case, uh, it could be argued one desired by management because it's reinstating a hydromorphic grassland rather than an acacia woodland, and we, the talk this afternoon will outline some of the negative changes. So let's get on to global change, the fourth of the drivers I, I wish to review. And uh, for the purposes of this, let's just stick to recognizing that there's effects on temperature, recognizing that there's effects on precipitation. We've already seen a graph that mean annual rainfall is important. If precipitation changes, um, we would expect differences. Most of the analyses of looking for directional trends in in temperature and precipitation have not proved too successful in terms of bush encroachment. It all comes down to atmospheric CO2. And yeah, we've grafted a little bit differently to the normal graph. We've grafted as a percent of the pre-industrial level, but you still get pretty much the same curve. But what I wish to illustrate here is that, you know, CO2 is actually being reasonably low. That increase as a percent of what used to be is being pretty low up until about the 1950s, and then there's been this exponential increase. And I think this is an important point to bear in mind when interpreting possible responses to CO2. Is okay, if a, a change of one or two percent can do it, then, then it's been happening since the mid-1700s. But on the basis of that graph, you'd expect greater changes um, as time proceeds. And what I tried to show you in the earlier graph is that a lot of the major changes that already, um, you know, were occurring in the 60s and 70s. But what is the evidence for CO2? Now, the process-based stuff, the experimental stuff, for example, CO2 chambers and looking at um, William Bond often produces, he gave a talk, I think, at one of these conservation symposiums where he's got his pictures of acacia roots. It's compelling evidence when you look at what CO2 concentration does to the growth of an individual woody plant. It's giving them reserves from which they can recover from disturbance. And then he's tried to use various field experiments. Bait and Verford all published a paper in which they looked at three fire experiments and, and uh, they, they argued that two of those experiments showed a, a strong CO2 effect. And they've done, tried to compare land uses for those involved with HRP. You're probably familiar with um, Ben Wigley's material there, they compared protected, communal, commercial. And they also deduced from that um, CO2 was in effect. But it is based on certain assumptions, and now is not the place, but one can contest the assumptions. It's not to say CO2 is not having an effect, it's to come to the conclusion that CO2 is a single primary effect, that I would argue in all these cases. Two out of three experiments is not necessarily a very convincing argument, and the land uses are certainly open to a more elaborate explanation, but n now is not the place or time. What I want to get to is the basic theme of our interpretation, is that we've had a set of drivers that have changed over time. Um, we've had the collapse of indigenous browsing ungulates, 
that on its own is arguably a major, major impact. Um, it's then being compounded by a history of fire suppression, which on its own is a major, major impact. We've had historical episodes such as Rinderpest in the 1890s, which, you know, was responsible for the death of over 90% of a lot of species, including livestock. Um, we've had a, a chronic increase in, in livestock numbers, and we've had, uh, which I haven't plotted on this one, obviously the CO2 story. The increase in livestock numbers we, we put in, yeah, at the 60s, 70s. So the point is, there's been an historical pattern. Indigenous herbivores fires could explain a lot of the changes we have witnessed. Um, certainly when you recognize that there are definite lag effects in the increase in a woody population. Um, I think this is a, a pretty legitimate explanation. Ah, oh, I see the actual, I can't see it up on the screen. The livestock numbers are actually on the graph here. Maybe you can see them, I can't. Um, but bottom line, it would be foolish in our opinion to draw the conclusion that it is all CO2. Part of the message it sends is that, oh well, what can I do? Whereas if you look at this sort of evidence and you recognize that you can play with browsers and you can play with grazing and you can play with fire, you have three basic tools by which to combat bush encroachment should that be a desired management objective. The other point that I haven't managed to illustrate well in the talk but is implicit in the paper is that exercising management options has to recognize the nature of the environment. Now this is a what I rate is one of the top three papers on savannah ecology in a totally obscure journal that no one ever reads. I see the actual, I can't see it up on the screen. The livestock numbers are actually on the graph here. Maybe you can see them, I can't. Um, but bottom line, it would be foolish in our opinion to draw the conclusion that it is all CO2. Part of the message it sends is that oh well, what can I do? Whereas if you look at this sort of evidence and you recognize that you can play with browsers and you can play with grazing and you can play with fire, you have three basic tools by which to combat bush encroachment should that be a desired management objective. The other point that I haven't managed to illustrate well in the talk but is implicit in the paper is that exercising management options has to recognize the nature of the environment. Now this is a, what I rate as one of the top three papers on savannah ecology in a totally obscure journal that no one ever reads. But this is Diane Spears work from the from the bush clearing trial up at um, across a set of sites in, in, well, started in Rhodesia, ended in Zimbabwe. And if you look at the slope of the curves, you've got a Metopus sand felt and a Metopus thorn felt. And you'll notice the thorn felt is a steep curve. In other words, a very sharp response to, to increase in annual rainfall. The sand felt, a very flat response. And that's all explained in terms of the influence of soil texture on soil moisture and nutrient dynamics. Um, so identical mean annual rainfall, but soil type, a critical factor to consider. Climatic variation, Tully low felt, a totally different relationship. It's a, it's a real semi-arid area. All I'm trying to illustrate that environment is critical for formulating management responses to bush encroachment. So when reviewing this, it was really interesting looking at some of the early scientific explanations. They were tuned in to the idiosyncrasies of the environment in which they operated. I've got a, a quote from Charlie Donaldson there that you can read through on your own on, on um, Swartark, what's it, Acacia mellifera up in the Malopo area. That's Northern Cape Kalari kind of stuff. And 
it, it is recent. These areas were actually only settled in uh, what was it? It was well post war, the 1960s or whatever. And within a couple of decades, they had major problems that hadn't been there before. And they were recognizing the nuances uh, back in those days. Lee Irving, he set up over 20 experiments at Toowoomba, which had bearing on bush encroachment. Again, a finesse of interpretation, which is lacking from most modern work. They might have lacked the, you know, the cool quantitative tools, but there was a, an intellectual depth of interrogation, which I fear um, we no longer witness in a lot of the sort of stuff in the rush to get a, another paper out, um, in which the, the paper becomes the objective rather than understanding what's going on. So I'm reinforcing, acknowledge your region, history, species, etc. The local nuances are critical in terms of trying to interpret what is going on in your particular part of the world. Now, I have not done a review of the implications for biodiversity. I think it's something waiting to be done. There is a small grain literature, but I just want to close with a, a couple of questions. Um, from what I've seen, I really find it an irrelevant question to ask, does bush encroachment have implications for biodiversity? Quite frankly, the answer is obviously yes, and if you can't work that out, you know, find another job. <laughs> um, what we actually need, if we're going to progress from here, is we need a conceptual framework that offers a vehicle for assessing the impacts on biodiversity, whether they, in terms of your defined objectives, pro or, or contra. Um, and I just thought I'd close with a couple of my own biases. Um, always use a talk to promote your own prejudice. Um, <laughs> I am concerned when I read a lot of conservation literature with this obsession about local diversity. People go measure species richness or a diversity index, and if the one's higher than the other place, somehow that's good. I can't see the logic of it. I don't know why more diversity is good at a particular point in place. Um, I actually think that the issue is there. What we should be trying to conserve is the integrity, the biodiversity integrity of systems, and loosely defined, that is how the system used to look when it used to function like, a, like it once was. Recognizing that, yes, there might be underlying historical changes that do not relate to, to human impacts. but. Maintaining biodiversity integrity, I'd advocate, should be a key aim of conservation organizations. And in this, yes, you can have a, a little tree pop up and a bush clump develop, and that's a hell of an increase in local species richness uh, across the trophic levels. You know, it'll bring in different insects, it'll bring in a few different birds, etc. But what you're actually doing is compromising, in, in the case of bush invasion of grassland, you're compromising the integrity of grassland. Grassland is a system that arguably operates at a certain spatial scale. That is being lost. It's something that is not apparent in conservation planning. Scale, the scale of systems. People look at all the hot spots of biodiversity. They don't look where these big chunks of remaining natural asset that, uh, in my opinion, should be a priority. So with those contentious points, thank you for your attention. <laughs>